Thank you for joining us today on this episode of The Sword and Trial. And today we welcome from Dallas, Texas, Dr. Ben Dunson, who is a teaching elder in the PCA. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what's been going on in that denomination. As always, we want to thank our Founders Alliance members who support us and pray for us and enable us to produce this kind of material that we hope will be beneficial to God's people everywhere. Welcome to the Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries, and Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. And today we had the privilege of having with us on the show my former professor, Dr. Ben Dunson. Uh, ben Dunson is a teaching elder in the PCA, and he's also a professor of New Testament in Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Uh, and he writes at American Reformer, lots of articles up there. And today we wanted to talk with Dr. Dunson specifically about the PCA and the recent General Assembly. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dunson. Yeah, it's my privilege. We're also delighted that uh, you have taught political theology for us at the Institute of Public Theology, and that's been a very popular course. In fact, we're going to offer it again in the fall. Uh, leading up to the presidential election. We felt like it might oh, be just very timely for people mm-hmm. to uh, think biblically about politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, that was great fun. So, yeah, tell us what happened. Uh, PCA, uh, a lot of people will recognize that as the Presbyterian Church of America, or in America. Is it in America? You get your prepositions right. It's in, in America, America. I believe. Yeah. Okay, in America. And uh, you guys just had your General Assembly. No, no, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even know my own denomination. Presbyterian <laughs> Church. Of America. Of America. What is it? Who knows? <laughs> okay, we yeah. will just skip that part. It's PCA. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you just had your General Assembly, right? And We just had it, yeah. And where was that? And then tell us what that actually is. So it was in Richmond, Virginia this year. And we have General Assembly every summer. Uh, I think it was, it was we didn't have it in, in uh, 2020 because of COVID, but it would, it's extremely rare that we wouldn't have General Assembly. And so it's the time every year where ruling elders and teaching elders in the PCA, so we, we distinguish um, typically the pastors are, are teaching elders. They're always going to be teaching elders. There's some other roles that um, would also be teaching elder. Um, so I, I have a call, but my call was as a seminary professor, and I'm a teaching elder. But then we have ruling elders in our churches who are not pastors, but they are uh, tasked with um, making decisions and ruling in the church. And uh, at General Assembly, every teaching elder can go to General Assembly and can be a voting member of the body. And then all of the churches are allowed to send a certain number of ruling elders to General Assembly based on how big of a church they are. And so, um, yeah, I think a typical church would probably send two or three. The bigger churches could send a few more. And, uh, and then all of those are the, the voting members of the body at General Assembly. And we have a variety of things that we are doing, um, a variety of things that we're voting on. Typically, the, the things that get the most attention are different overtures. So our presbyteries, our regional um uh, bodies uh, of elders will present overtures to the General Assembly that we then vote on. Uh, those overtures have to pass at General Assembly, then they have to go to the presbyteries throughout the year, and they have to pass by uh, a two-thirds margin in the presbyteries, and then they'll go back to General Assembly, and they have to pass uh, again by a majority vote in the, the second year. I think it's not dissimilar from things that happen in the uh, Southern Baptist Annual Convention, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, um, and, and that's what gets the most attention because there will be different um, tweaks to our Book of Church order that's binding on all elders in the PCA, and that will have to do with uh, practice in the, the denomination um, sometimes it'll be other uh, other interesting issues that are are coming up. Um, this year, a very strange thing happened in that a single teaching elder put forward uh, an overture to create a study committee for the book Jesus Calling. Mm. That book was written by a PCA church member, 
and then I think it was being sold in the denominational bookstore for a while, and then they took it down. And uh, it's just, I don't know if it's ever happened before, but I know it, it's extremely rare for a single elder to put something forward like that, and then for it to make it all the way to General Assembly. Uh, his own presbytery didn't, um, didn't um, I, I'm forgetting the right word now, but ratify it mm-hmm. to send it, and so that's even weirder. And it goes to General Assembly. We have an overtures committee that meets the first day, and they essentially decide what they are going to recommend go to the floor of the General Assembly to actually be voted on. And uh, that one actually went through overtures and made it to the floor of the Assembly, and the Assembly actually approved it, which is almost unheard of for a single mm. member to, to have done something like that. So well, that, that's the kind of business that we're, we're mainly about. Was he wanting to get it back in the bookstores? <laughs> no, no, he he um, he was uh, very very opposed to the book, and I think he even thought that the PCA had some uh, blame for this thing mm. having been widely distributed, and um, it it was really it was really interesting because. I, I honestly was somewhat ambivalent about this. I think the book is not good. Um, it's putting words into Jesus' mouth, so I have no no uh, problem saying that. Um, we should completely avoid that. But I, I was uh, somewhat ambivalent about whether we need another study committee because there's a lot of bad books out there, and and um, yeah, that could really take up the time of the General Assembly. <laughs> but a lot of guys um, spoke to this overture, and it was people that maybe I wouldn't have even expected. They just seemed to be like... Uh, very, very much in the center of the PCA. And I, I remember one guy, I mean, he, he had, you know, he had a, a, a beard and a ponytail and um, T-shirt. And so, I mean, you look at me, he's, he's probably not um, <laughs> center of the PCA. In, in the exact same uh, environment that I would minister in. But he said, he said his mom no longer reads her Bible for her personal devotions because she just reads Jesus calling. Wow. And so that's why he was in support of this committee. So I was actually surprised by how opposed people were and upset they were. And it kind of wow. caused me even to reevaluate. Wow. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, um, the the PCA has long been kind of a stalwart of conservative reformed evangelical belief in, in the United States. Um, can you tell us maybe just a little bit about the history of the PCA? Cause it's not that old of a denomination. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel like I'm back in my ordination exams now. Uh, (laughs) Gotta get these details right. Uh, so it was, it was founded in 1973. It, it came out of the Southern Presbyterian Church, um, which was, uh, had drifted for quite a while into theological liberalism, and the the more confessional people that were still left uh, finally had had enough and decided to leave. Um, they, um, they merged with uh, another uh, denomination, um, which was Francis Schaeffer, the one that he was in, the RPCES, I believe, in the early 80s and and that's that's how we got covenant college and covenant seminary they came in with that merger and um yeah so not not a particularly old presbyterian denomination but has been um has been faithful to Mm -hmm. to scriptures and and to our confession for some time and the westminster confession is is your confession as a denomination and as i said you've been a conservative denomination however you know the pca is not without its problems um and as the southern baptist convention has long been considered a conservative evangelical um, association of churches or denomination the, the sbc has its problems but particularly at the Um, intersection of cultural issues that we're dealing with in society and how those interplay then in our churches. And so what are the big issues that, and often these become issues of conflict between churches, what are the big issues that the PCA has been dealing with recently and how did those kind of come to the fore in the General Assembly this year? Well, as you know, this month is June and it is Pride Month, and we are very proud of what the Lord has done in us in creating us male and female. And so for this month, we are doing a special for anyone who joins the Founders Alliance membership. We are giving away The Beauty of the Binary by Luke Griffo, male and female, he created them. Just go to founders.org slash give and you can join at any level in the fam and we will send you a copy of The Beauty of the Binary.
Well, I think it's a lot of the same issues that, that Southern Baptists are facing. The, the big one over the last, uh, I would say, six or seven years or more has been sexuality, uh, in particular how to deal with, um, with homosexuality in the church and the different claims made by Revoice and, and Side B, Christianity and things like that, where, where there were the people, um, uh, the, the, um, the Matthew Vines and the, the Nate Collins and the um, Greg Johnsons of the world. So Greg Johnson was the one that was doing this in the PCA. He was an ordained minister in the PCA, arguing that you could have, you could have um, homosexual desires that as long as you didn't act on them, um, in terms of sexual activity or, or lust, that those were not desires that had to be mortified. You know, that somehow you could have this kind of almost like neutral bad desire, and um, and so the PCA was was trying to deal with that for a while. They had a study committee on this. Study committees aren't binding though um, in the PCA, and Greg Johnson was was openly teaching this, openly supporting Revoice. And ultimately, he he was brought up on charges, but but they he was he was not actually um, defrocked, and um, he he just decided to leave. I think he eventually just had enough and was tired of it. But but the PCA never actually forced him to leave, or or said that he had actually violated any sort of ordination vow. So that. That whole issue, and we can go into more detail about that, but that that issue is probably the the big one. Um, and then issues of where women um, should uh, fit into the life of the church and and ministry of the church as well. You know, when you talk about uh, Greg Johnson, he no longer is a minister in the PCA. Um, he was brought up on charges. Was that at the Presbytery level or the General Assembly level? Well, I mean, it would have to start at it would have to start at the lowest level of just him himself. Someone would would um, they they can bring a charge to presbytery. I think that's how it would, how it happened. If if memory serves me correctly, the uh, other presbyteries can actually even say that a presbytery is not intervening when it should, mm-hmm. and they can they can um, they can bring that before the general assembly. And that happened with him. Um, but nothing ever came of that. Um, really, he just eventually left. Why do you think that nothing came of it? I mean, what were the reasons? Honestly, I, I don't really understand it because uh, it went to what we call the, the Standing Judicial Commission, which can can try these cases, and they, they, they operate as a commission, which means that they uh, they actually have authority to act as a, as a delegated commission, but they didn't do anything in his case um, I, possibly it's just that there's there's still a lot of confusion about this. Um, w- when people were claiming at the time that you could have gay desires and uh, as long as you didn't act on them, that it wasn't sinful. I think mm-hmm. it took a while for people to, to recognize that's not right, mm-hmm. but that, that biblically speaking, desires are an aspect of of righteousness or of sin, you you have corrupt desires, and those are have to be mortified. So I th- I think there was some confusion. Um, I don't know. I mean, people are not wanting to to be perceived as being uh, narrow and mean spirited. Um, mm-hmm. I honestly don't know why they didn't act um, with regard to him. It, the church that hosted Revoice wasn't that in St. Louis. Am I remembering that? That was right? in St. Louis. That's did, right. Did, didn't that church? Did that church pull out of the PCA? That church has left. Okay, that's right. And when any church um, decides they no longer want to be a part of the PCA, is that in their purview to leave? I know there was when, at the start of the PCA that was part of the struggle, yeah. wasn't it? it? Was property and. So right. A, yeah, they can leave. There's a process for doing it. In um, you do it through Presbytery through a process. Um, but yeah, it's it's if they want to leave, uh, then they're allowed to leave. I, it, congregation has to vote and um, and decide they want to leave. Mm-hmm. But it, ultimately, it's not particularly difficult. You know, this whole side B uh, issue of the homosexual question is something that has created a great great deal of confusion. And I've been a 
appreciative of Rosaria Butterfield's clarity on mm-hmm. this. And she's spoken with increasing clarity over the last few years. Her last book on Five Lies is just very, very mm. clear on this. And didn't she address some kind of meeting? Well, maybe it wasn't the PCA, but something uh, that was like a tangent meeting or something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, so the Gospel Reformation Network, which is, is probably the largest network of confessional PCA uh, elders, they hosted a dinner on uh, Wednesday night, so right in the middle of General Assembly. They hosted a dinner, and she was the keynote speaker of that dinner, and she gave a, a pretty um, a pretty fiery speech um, about, it was primarily about the issues about revoice and things. So that's not an official meeting of the General mm-hmm. Assembly. Um, that's, uh, that's a side event, but... Um, I think there were nearly a thousand people there um, that were there for General Assembly. How many people showed up at the General Assembly? You know, I don't know that the the numbers. I don't know if they count visitors or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as as total number of voting commissioners, I think it was it was somewhere around twenty four hundred, twenty five hundred. Oh, okay. Um, if memory serves me right. so But there, there's a lot more people there that are there as visitors as well. So this, obviously, you know, this issue came up, Side B Christianity, the revoice issue came up in Rosaria's speech. Did it come up in any other way in the meeting proper in GA? Yeah, so we, we've done some things to deal with this over the last few years, and um, that was not really uh, prominent this year. I think um, that was a lot more prominent over the last Mm -hmm. three years Mm -hmm. where there were different overtures that were put forward. Uh, They were trying to get to this point where they could essentially exclude someone from being ordained who uh, is, is, countenancing revoice i think it it originally some of the overtures were strong more strongly worded um to explicitly reject revoice they got watered down somewhat um but they still are saying that a minister has to personally embody um uh, sexual purity and I, th- I think they're fairly clear on that and then also not um, be teaching anything that would would contradict that. And I think most people would, would, would say now that that has become clarified for the PCA, um, that wasn't, that wasn't, um, really dealt with as much this year. Although Rosaria in her, her talk, she did, um, she did make a, a point that from her vantage point, there's still churches in the PCA that are teaching this. And, mm. and I think that's right. There are, they 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 might not be as prominent as Greg Johnson and his church, but there are still people that are comfortable with that and that are teaching that. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Sword and the Trowel. I just want to make you aware that every order that you place this June at press.founders.org, everyone will get one of these vintage copies of the Founders Journal. This is coming from spring 2001, titled Ready for Reformation. Uh, Dr. Tom Nettles has a great article in here. I would definitely recommend you grab a book that you've been looking at this month so you can get this vintage copy of the Founders Journal as well. Go to press.founders.org. So what do you think the way forward on this issue is for the PCA? I mean, there's the way that maybe it will go or you think that it might go, but what what should the PCA do? I mean, do you think the PCA has done enough? Well, it's it's one of those things where a lot of times we'll we'll change wording in in our book of church order, we'll make things more explicit. And it's easy to think that that's that's the end, that's kind of the <laughs> the, the final victory. I, I find often that that's actually the, the more dangerous point. Uh, you've done that, but if you're not going to do anything with it, then the, the Constitution itself is just a piece of paper. Mm. You know, you've got to enforce it. Mm-hmm. And that is more unpleasant because then that gets you into filing charges against people and uh, requiring people to adhere to what you have said. So I think there's still going to be the need for that. I, I, I can't speak to specific instances because I'm not, I'm not as familiar with, with them. But if people are still teaching this, then 
they're going to have to be um, they're going to have to be required to cease teaching this. And uh, that's that's the unpleasant business of actually enforcing what we have implemented in our constitution. It's unfortunate from the vantage point of it, just it can be unpleasant, but it's also necessary. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it just it always remains to be seen. You know, will people have the will to actually follow through? Ben, uh, I mean, you're PCA, we're Baptist, and we're part of the, our church is part of the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, periodically, we'll have these conversations of why should anybody who's not SBC care about the SBC? Why should anybody who's not PCA care about the PCA? And, and yet, they should. If there's serious mm-hmm. Christians living in this nation, the United States, or even in the West, uh, there's reasons to be uh, concerned and uh, to be cheering for good outcomes of these kinds of meetings and deliberations. What do you say to people who say, yeah, it's PCA, you guys do your own thing. I'm over here in my uh, Bible church or non-denominational church. And so it doesn't matter. We're going to do what God wants us to do. What, how do you, how do you think about those things? How do you help other people to think about those things? Yeah, so it's it's probably an easier temptation for Baptists, right? Because uh, the PCA is so much smaller than the, the Southern Baptist <laughs> Convention. Uh, it seems it seems more obvious to me, you know, why what happens for the, the Southern Baptists is going to impact other Christians in America. Uh, but I think it, it it does. If if things go badly in in one faithful denomination, it it affects everyone. Um, I I think so. You know when when, when the the law amendment didn't didn't uh, pass this year, as soon as I saw that, I I, I felt bad. Um, you know, and I thought, okay, I think the PCA right now is is handling those issues better. Uh, and this summer, that's actually one of the things we dealt with, and I think in a really helpful in a really good way. But when I see that happen, what that makes me think instantly is. For one, the, the the enemies of that am, amendment are going to, to take this as a victory, mm-hmm. and they're going to try to use that to gain even further momentum, not just in their denomination, but you know all across. You know, people who are sympathetic to that, they'll they'll use that as as proof that the tide is turning, and and I mean, even just people getting demoralized that alone. Mm-hmm. Yep. can can really harm of movement because when you when you feel defeated you just want to give up and so i think that impact can that can cross denominational boundaries um, we don't really we can't really just stand on our own what what's uh, is it franklin's quote you either hang hang together or you hang alone um i i feel that as our culture shifts and becomes extremely hostile towards christians you know if if one denomination gives way it just uh, it discourages other people to stand mm-hmm. firm and hold the line, and um, and do what's necessary. It just it it demoralizes them, makes them think it's too costly. Yeah, I also think you know Presbyterians for a long time in this country have kind of punched above their weight in terms of just theological training. Um, the amount of Presbyterians and the writings that they produce and, and the way that they are influential upon Baptist just Baptists mm-hmm. alone. I mean, th- that's. One reason why the PCA, its seminaries, Greenville, RTS, you know, that aren't maybe not specifically PCA, but very much associated with and, and trained ministers in the PCA. I mean, that's that's very important. And mm-hmm. those that does have an effect even directly upon Baptists, Baptist churches and Baptist ministers. Yeah. And I yeah. want to underscore what you said, too, just about the uh, fraternal uh, relationships that do exist. When, when Founders was started, one of the things that we talked about more than 40 years ago was a proper kind of ecumenism. Uh, a recognition that we have brothers that we disagree with on things like baptism and church order and, and polity and such as that, but we're genuine brothers. We agree on the gospel, we agree on God's law, and we uh, stand shoulder to shoulder. And as the culture gets increasingly dark and hostile to the things of Christ, that sense of brotherhood uh, needs to become more appreciated and preserved, and we ought to encourage one another in that. So, I mean, I was pulling for uh, you guys in the PCA. Didn't know all the issues. I knew a couple of them that you just mentioned that they would come out good, that you guys would take good stands. Yeah. I was so pleased what you did a few years ago about Revoice when it looked like that might not happen, mm-hmm. but you yeah. guys really rallied and did well. And so I, that's true for every Christian. If you're a God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian, you ought to be pulling for these yeah. associations of churches or uh, 
denominations that are trying to hold the line. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, you, de- you dealt with issues similar to the law amendment that we dealt with uh, this year at the SBC. What were those issues? Mm-hmm. It had to do with uh, deaconesses and female elders. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, so we've had a couple of instances where women were preaching in, in PCA churches. There was one in New York and uh, that came to the attention of General Assembly it's either last summer or the one before. I'm, I'm forgetting now. And um, actually in my presbytery as well, in North Texas, there was an instance where there was a woman preaching. And it was in a, in a Sunday morning service. Uh, and it was, there were some verbal games being played mm-hmm. where they said, um, so the pastor preached, but she, uh, she got up and read scripture and uh, gave a lesson. They were kind of using Anglican <laughs> terminology <laughs> and, um, and said, well, the elders said it wasn't preaching, so it's not preaching. Um, that church just abruptly left the PCA as well, right in the middle of a Presbytery meeting. They didn't even follow the procedure. They're just like, we're leaving. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I think the, the one in New York's being dealt with, but um, I, I can guarantee that this has happened in, in other churches as well. So there, there's that issue um, that there have been instances of women preaching. Um, there are other instances where you'll find, say, maybe online, they're, they're listing women as a minister of this, you know, minister of mm. um, whatever, minister of children or um, uh, deacons. The deacon issue was kind of complex because some churches were calling women deaconesses. So they were saying that there was this unordained position of deaconess in addition to the male-only deacon, which is what the PCA requires, there were some that refused to ordain any deacons, and they had a commissioning service for men and women to basically do that work, but they won't ordain anyone to the office of deacon. Hmm. Um, There there were some that, and there's there's a variety of ways that people are kind of trying to get around this and uh, and claim that they can can have um, in practice female deacons, but not actually give them the title deacon. So we had, we had an overture that originated last year. So it already went through general assembly, went through all the presbyteries and then came back this year. And it passed this year where it, it explicitly says that, uh, that you may not refer to any unordained man or woman, um, who, uh, as, um, the, the, the three, uh, uh, positions either pastor elder or deacon and um and then it also had an extra qualifier qualifier this is a little bit more debated i'm finding but the the qualifier said essentially and don't give titles that are associated with those roles <laughs> to people who are not in them um and so a very straightforward reading of that in my mind would be that you you couldn't call the woman a deaconess either mm. but i found that some people um even that are really close on my side, don't think that that's the, the way to, to take that. I don't, I don't know how that'll go, but it passed. And so it was very explicit in not allowing this. So uh, that struck me as being something similar to what the law amendment was trying to do. And uh, and so this one's now enshrined into our book of church order. Now, and that's that's one of the differences I wanted to point out. An overture is different from a resolution that mm-hmm. say we would put out put forward in the Southern Baptist <clears throat> Convention. In that, an overture is actually binding upon churches. Yeah. Right, right. Which I guess I mean from a from a Baptist polity would not be possible. Would right. it? I mean, you couldn't really do that. Well, in the Constitution, which was the law amendment to the Constitution, the Constitution, if it's enforced, would have. Yeah. Uh, uh, that kind of authority on the boundaries of association and cooperation. Right. You know, listening to you describe uh, that debate, I, I think, was it Tim Keller or Kathy Keller? One of them said that a woman can do everything that an unordained man can do in the church. Cause that, yeah. that argument has been used in our circles and Baptist uh, debates as well. So would you say that, that what was decided would be pushing back against that idea then yeah, that's a really good question because there's still a lot of people in the PCA that would 100% agree with that that sentiment, um, and I don't think they would see this as having having dealt with that because um, it's not it's certainly not dealing with 
um, any aspects of the worship service um, apart from preaching. Um, so there's mm-hmm. there's still probably going to be debate. Should a woman read scripture in the worship service and, and things like that? I, I think you'd have to say that that's not something that's been settled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, although we had a study committee on that, which which um, it has some aspects that, that I wouldn't agree with. But study committees are not they're not binding um, on anyone. Um, so yeah, there's going to still be some issues related to that that probably are not settled, but specifically on the office thing, I think that, that one, it was pretty clear. Mm-hmm. And I think that's settled now. However, at general assembly, uh, you had quite a few people speaking against this overture this year. I mean, I, they're, they're a minority overall. They're, they're mm-hmm. a pretty small minority, I think overall, but the arguments that they were using were, um, were kind of uh, staggering to me. Uh, the first one just simply got up and said, the Bible allows women deacons. Um, and that means that our book of church order is wrong. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if he's right, we're the PCA is wrong. And so, it, that, but that was just his argument. Well, the Bible allows it, so we we can do it. Um, but that that obviously doesn't work. I mean, you either have to change the polity and, and allow for that, or you need to go somewhere where they already allow that. And there's there's already. Presbyterian denominations that allow that. There's EPC and and others uh, that allow that. We had other uh, another gentleman who got up and said, in in a Korean context, our culture demands that we call men and women elder uh, out of respect, mm. and um, and that was it. It was just our culture demands it, <laughs> and uh, and then we had some that got up and just said, well, we've been ordaining deaconesses for decades and. Um, you know, no one cared. So, you know, why should we have to stop now? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but not a single person said the PCA's book of church order allows this. Mm-hmm. Not a single person made that argument. You know, it sounds like some of the people that uh, attended your general assembly first attended the uh, annual meeting of the SBC <laughs> and just carried the same arguments over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us today for this conversation on the sword and the trial. I wanted to make you aware and give you some more details on the regional conference that we are going to be having coming up here this July. That's July 26th and 27th, and it is a conference on family life in the negative world. Uh, Pastor Tom Askell, Dr. Joel Beakey, and myself will all be there speaking for that conference. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, you can go to founders.org slash family life in order to register for that conference. It's just a shorter conference, a regional conference. It's just two days, but it's going to be a wonderful time time of fellowship and thinking about what God has to say to us when it comes to how we are to live in families, be family members, and raise our families in a, an increasingly hostile world. You know, it's interesting just hearing the way that you talk about this, you know, the the ways that churches kind of try to get around doing this that they're required to do and doing that that they're required to do. It, it is amazing. I mean, like, you hate it. You, you hate that kind of stuff, but that's actually where the battle is yeah, in the, in, is. on the denominational level. It's like these stupid little details that people like see in these loopholes, you actually have to fight on that level. And you just you feel like, oh man, I feel like I'm just, I'm, I'm nitpicking. I'm, I'm doing this. It feels mean spirited, but that's where error creeps into the church slowly. Oh, well, you know, they're not really deaconesses. We're just calling them deaconesses. Yeah. I mean, well, and yeah. then five years later, we're ordaining deaconesses. And so you really actually do have to fight the battle on those. It's like, you know, gas seeping under the door. You got you to <laughs> stop it. And it's not necessarily where you want to fight the battle, but it actually is where the battle needs to be fought. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Graham, I'm yeah. just uh, amazed that you'd be so concerned about women pastors when we didn't even adopt the Nicene Creed. And what's wrong with <laughs> that? You know? Yeah, I heard about that. I heard about that. Very, very troubling, right? You don't even believe the Nicene Creed. Oh, man. You know, um, Graham, you know, something you just said uh, made me think of something that Tom said as well. Um, like, I, and so, sometimes I feel like I'm kind of a weirdo because I, I think I'm a very ecumenical person. A person within Protestant evangelicalism in one sense, I actually think denominationalism is really healthy mm. uh, because I, within my denomination, I think, well, we have, we have a book of church order. We have, we have a constitution, we have rules. 
And no one is requiring, no one's putting a gun up to someone's head and saying, you have to be in this denomination. No mm. one's uh, forcing someone against their will to affirm these things and say that you have to adhere to these things. And so I don't feel bad in the least in saying, you join this willingly. Mm. This is what we believe. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to require very strictly require you to adhere to this. And there's not going to be any leeway within the denomination, but outside of that, I don't feel the need in the least to fight with my Baptist brothers, you know, about these things because I'm not a Baptist. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see the unity that we have in Christ and I don't feel the need to, to, try to force Baptists to be Presbyterians. Um, you know, it's like within this, you, you, you adhere to what you agreed to voluntarily. And why wouldn't you, mm -hmm. there's other places you can go. Amen. Amen. Well put. Well, Ben, thank you so much for, uh, joining us today, educating us a little bit on, uh, our PCA brethren and how you guys have conducted business. And we are pulling for you. We're grateful for all the good things that the PCA has done, is doing, will do. And, Grateful for the work that you're going to begin doing full time now at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and look forward to having further conversations with you down the road. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today on the Sword and Trial. If this has been a useful conversation for you, we encourage you to spread it around. And if we can do anything for you here at Founders to encourage you or help you in any way, please reach out and let us know.